All right, so we're working our way around the EU tonight. Uh, now we want to take a closer look uh, about at Germany, specifically looking at German-Russian relations. Now, over the past few decades, um, when we're talking about Germany and Russia, the issue has always been, uh, you know, trade relations, those sort of connections, uh, and generally since the crisis in Ukraine and in the larger area began, those impressions, the impressions Russians have of Germans or that Germans have of Russians have gone down a bit. Relations have become more tense. Um, but what we want to start to look at is how uh, Russian state-controlled media and also the Russian foreign ministry has been dealing with certain issues in Germany lately. Now, the story that has been focused on a lot in January is the story of a 13-year-old girl named Lisa. Uh, and this story kind of blew up uh, as the story in Russian media that was addressed by the foreign minister of a 13-year-old Russian speaker from Berlin uh, who was raped uh, allegedly by a migrant. Now, this was something that was not uh, covered in the German press that was receiving extensive coverage in Russian press that was addressed uh, by the Russian foreign ministry as something of a cover-up that wasn't being put there. And, you know, there was also documented evidence of faked reports, faked vox pops talking to people on the street where people were saying they were afraid to go out, that they wanted to move back to Russia, people who were traced back to working in other capacities for Russian media. Now, this test uh, kind of touches on a very difficult point. Now, Germany has had about a million uh, potential asylees registered in Germany this year. It's an issue that Chancellor Merkel has taken a very strong position on, supporting people's right to enter Germany and apply, though there have been some restrictions on that so far. Uh, and this issue, when we're talking about Lisa, what makes it so significant is that it was later proven, uh, at least when the investigators had spoken to her, that she was not rape, that this wasn't the case. They examined her phone. It was shown she was over at a friend's home, that she was trying to get away from her parents, and that she was concerned about what they might think. Uh, so it is a person who exists, but for all intents and purposes, there, there is no rape that can be proven, and it seems like a case really focused on to try and divide Germany, in, a, in particular on an issue that, though Angela Merkel has been uh, lauded for it, is a very difficult one domestically. But we want to discuss that a little bit more, so we're joined by two excellent guests. We have Andreas Umland, a senior research fellow at the Institute for Euro-Atlantic Cooperation, and we also have Ulrich Speck, a senior fellow at the Transatlantic Academy in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for inviting us. Thanks for having us. So, I want to start with a little bit of a provocative question because this isn't the only story that's been out in the media. There is also another one talking about uh, this so-called uh, German politician, Dmitry Rempel, who has this party called Die Einheit, who this week was cited as saying there are thousands of Russian speakers in Germany prepared to move to Crimea. So has the situation in Germany become so dire that Russian speakers fear for their lives and need to flee immediately? I mean, obviously, uh, the Russian propaganda is trying to use this as to portray Germany uh, open door policy as uh, as a threat, because Muslims are coming from the south. This is a well known theme in in Russia, and uh, I think there ha is a domestic angle to that. So, in order to demonstrate that the West is uh, somehow at the brink and and is under threat and is uh, acting irresponsibly by opening the door to asylum seekers. That's, that's, that's the domestic angle, but there's also a foreign policy angle from the Russian point of view, which is um, demonstrate that Russia has influence in Germany mm -hmm. domestically through its Russian-speaking population. So we, had, uh, we have seen 10,000 uh, people on the street. We have seen a demonstration in front of the chancellery. So this is, um, I think, it's kind of, I mean, it's it's f straight from the arsenal of um, hybrid warfare, which is um, a psych op. It's um, trying to influence public opinion and demonstrate to German leaders that Russia um, has tools has influence. I mean, in this, Germany. It's interesting because you're saying this is a tool, and it's a tool we've seen used elsewhere. It's a tool we've seen, uh, you know, used in Estonia, used in Latvia, used in Ukraine, other places where there was a Russian-speaking community. But it's not really one that we've seen uh, previously used outside the former Soviet Union. So right. I think that's it's quite the, the point is here that um, the Kremlin seems to think that Merkel is weak, and um, they can further um, weaken her. Um, the, the, there is, of course, I mean, she, uh, Merkel is weaker than she was in, in the last maybe 10 years, 
but it doesn't mean that he, she is about to get kicked out of the chancellery. Um, she, she has trouble and, and, and uh, Russia is trying to use the situation to weaken her because she is seen as the one person that is um, uh, being most hawkish on Russia. She was uh, very, very influential on the sanctions policy. Um, so in a way, the Kremlin sees her as an opponent uh, to its policy in Europe, but also in Ukraine. And I mean, this idea of division has been very clear this week. You had the visit of Horst Seehofer, um, the minister president of Bavaria, who's been much more critical on the migrant issue, going to Moscow and meeting with Putin. I and mean, what sort of, uh, this seems unprecedented. Would you agree? Yes, that's uh, it's so far um, unusual that Seehofer is not, of course, in the federal government, but mm -hmm. he represents uh, uh, just Bavaria, and uh, it has been interpreted also as perhaps a domestic political step uh, mm -hmm. that is uh, sort of uh, so it's a foreign it's a foreign trip, but it has uh, repercussions uh, also in the domestic area. But if that was indeed the case, I think it has backfired for Seehofer mm -hmm. because, uh, and I'm encouraged also by the feedback that this has received because. Uh, there was a lot of critique of this uh, visit by Seehofer uh, to Putin. And Putin, of course, used the event to, to make a special case out of it and to, to, um, uh, to present himself with, with Seehofer and to get as much as possible out of it. And that was recognized by many German commentators, and the critique was devastating of the, of the, mm -hmm. um, of the visit. And in a way, um, as with the, with the Lisa case with this, with this, with this girl, so there were these attempts to to do something in Germany or with Germany. But in, in, a, in a way, I would say that the, that the feedback or the, the repercussions of it actually work against Russian interests because the Lisa case has, has sort of demonstrated to the Germans what, the, what Russia did in Ukraine, the sort of creating of insecurity, using dubious cases to make up uh, cases, mm -hmm or um, uh, in the case of Seehofer, the, uh, the, the critique was then so harsh of, the, of his uh, uh, visit that it had, has actually rather hardened, I would say, mm -hmm. the, well, it's quite the, interesting, the critical position Especially with him uh, sometimes referred to as something like a German Donald Trump trying to appeal to populist issues, but <laughs> I <wouldn't laughs> not quite in agreement. All right. Well, and also uh, more of a limited response. But we had one video we wanted to show, if you want to introduce that to uh, get some Yeah, reaction. so uh, to sort of go back and talk about the, you know, the issue of whether um, what Russia is doing is, is an attempt to destabilize the situation in Germany or whether it's aimed at the local population in Russia as well. So we talked to a uh, political editor at Bild, Julian Röpke, earlier uh, this week about uh, liaison between left-wing German parties and representatives of the so-called Donetsk People's Republic. Uh, here's what he had to say about that and Putin's influence in Germany. Let's take a look. Left party in Germany, Die Linke, invited uh, Alexei Markov in, uh, to talk on Skype to a huge conference organized. Um, uh, it was the days of Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, would you please comment on this event and on the scandal around this in event in Germany? Peter Tiede, who was there, uh, uh, wrote about this. Uh, he was at the conference and there were, for example, Oskar Lafontaine, and Sarah Wagenknecht, uh, who are really high-ranking figures in Die Linke, German party. Uh, they were there at this day. And uh, Mr. Markov said that uh, they are fighting fascists, uh, which they think they are, uh, which is basically the um, Ukrainian army and uh, yeah, Ukrainians uh, organized by Kiev. And it was very interesting that uh, the, the organizers of this conference, uh, they applauded him and they wished him most of luck in fighting the fascists. And um, when uh, our, my colleague Peter Tiede asked them uh, if Mr. Markov is standing on the EU sanctions list, so he is since uh, early 2014 sanctioned by the EU and he may not be sponsored, for example, uh, the organizer from the Junge Welt, uh, Young World, which is a left-wing German newspaper, he says, uh, no, we are not interested that he is on this list because this list was created by people who are committing state terrorism daily. So he was talking about the European governments. Well, 
I, I cannot uh, talk about every single politician, but at this conference, Rosa Luxemburg conference, there were many people from, from Die Linke, uh, and they were basically repeating the Russian allegations that, uh, for example, in Ukraine, Russia is fighting uh, Nazis and is fighting fascists, which I think everyone knows is, is not the case. So we have these left-wing parties in Germany who are um, inviting DNR representatives to speak at their conferences, and clearly there's some sort of connection between the Kremlin and these parties, which we've heard about connections to right-wing parties in Europe, but apparently also left-wing parties. Can you talk a little bit about what is going on there and what role Russia is playing? First, I think one has to clarify uh, this Alexei Markov. He is from a, a battalion from an... Um, uh, sort of uh, uh, Russian militia in the DNR called Ghost, mm -hmm. and uh, he's actually a Russian. So mm -hmm. he, on his Kontakte side, he gives as his, I think, his um, uh, city of birth was uh, Omsk, and, and the city he studied was Novosibirsk, uh, the city he lives is Moscow. So he's actually a Russian who is fighting in, in, in Ukraine. That mm -hmm. is actually uh, the, mm -hmm. the scandal here. Mm -hmm. uh, and and they, they invited him as a sort of representative of, U of Eastern Ukraine. That was, <laughs> that was bizarre. One has also to say that the conference was not a conference of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation that is sometimes m mixed up. I think it was also not an official conference of the party. The Linke, the left. So it was a sort of a leftish conference organized by um, Young World, Junge, Junge Welt, this newspaper, which is edited by a former Stasi um, uh, uh, informant. So, so that's a sort of a particular circle within the German left that seems to be sort of consist to considerable degree of representatives of the former East German regime of uh, especially of Stasi people. So that is the particular context of this particular conference. I think the, the left and, and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation would have not invited somebody like Markov. I but think what, the, is their, the, what, what, what is their attraction? Like, why do they think uh, aligning themselves with it's a, it's a rare it, number. How yeah. do you do both the far left and the I think far right at the Ulrich, same time? Ulrich I can, think in, in uh, general, I mean, what, what is attracting um, <clears throat> people to Russia and Germany is anti-Americanism. Mm -hmm. The idea that the US is an imperialist power and needs to be counterbalanced. And the person who is doing that mostly, obviously, on the world scene is Vladimir Putin. So this has much to do with the US, with America, with the view of America, and often it has very little to do with Russia. These people often know nothing about Russia or nothing about Ukraine. It's rather a kind of ideological game. And we also have to say that Germany has still, uh, still, I say, uh, not yet um, a large uh, right-wing party, not like France, not like Denmark, Sweden. <clears throat> so it's, it's kind of limited yet. Um, and the, the general, cons I mean, th these are not people from the mainstream. This is not the consensus. It's, it's important to say. But, however, on the left with Linkspartei and on the right with Alternative für Deutschland, there are two parties that are potentially interesting for Russia, uh, for the Kremlin, um, as some kind of a partner on, on joint um, but when, of, uh, endeavors. But it doesn't mean that they are directly listening to the Kremlin. They're not agents of the Kremlin. They're ideological and they're looking for partners. And there are specific points of that, um, absolutely. I mean, the interesting issue that we see is these kind of new divisions and the extent to which they're able to be used, um, a certain dissatisfaction with the status quo. Um, but I mean, I want to ask, to focus on this issue of the Russian-speaking community in Germany. I mean, first of all, a lot of articles miscited it. They talked about the number of, you know, three million ethnic Russians living in Germany. Obviously, that's not correct. Most of the people, or many of them, are Jewish or have some degree of German heritage or Russian speakers in the former Soviet Union. But, uh, Andreas, I'd be curious what you think. Is this a more attractive or appealing issue because uh, it, there have been difficulties kind of integrating this community? You have a, you know, an op-ed that was in Bloomberg by Leonid Bershitsky where he's arguing these people are perfectly integrated and they're bitter that there are migrants arriving uh, and they're frustrated about that. Other people have argued that's less the case and it has more to do with people coming from the former Soviet Union having more racist beliefs than, say, many Germans do in similar age groups. And is it an attempt to capitalize that? Or, or what is the status of that group in Germany? 
Well, I wouldn't dramatize it too much because, after all, if you look at the numbers, uh, so there, uh, you just said three million, and there are even larger numbers for the Russian speakers in in in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. The numbers I've heard are oh, go yeah. up to six yeah. million, yeah. and. Um, and uh, in the demonstrations with the Lisa case, there were 10,000. So the, the, you know, it's not a big thing. And, mm -hmm. and uh, there have been also a number of so-called Russian Germans or Russia Germans who have said, these demonstrators are not representative of our community. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, one has to acknowledge that uh, these, these Russian speakers, they are under the influence of, uh, of Russia because many of them watch Russian television and they get this whole load of, of propaganda. Of course, that it, in Germany it's balanced out by, by German media or mm -hmm. by other, other media, but they still are attracted to it. Um, Russian media is also very well financed. They have also lots of entertainment on it. I, I know that from, from, um, from people who are close who, who like Russian TV because, you know, you have lots of concerts and shows and so on, and they also watch then the the political shows, and so they, they are exposed to it. I'm not even sure that this whole Lisa case was a, a planned operation. I think there, you have this constant vilification of the West on Russian television, and this particular case just created then this, this, uh, this sudden uh, uh, demonstrations in, in, in Germany. I, I'm not sure it was planned or something. It was simply, you know, in the whole Taking flow of... Uh, of, of Opportunistic. Uh, it, uh, it was just one thing that came up and that uh, suddenly catched the attention of the Russian Germans in, and, and then they started themselves mm -hmm. actually to become active and then the NPD, the, the far right, got involved. There. I'll have to end it there. not planned, but um, Lavrov backed it, so it, there was a sign yes. that it has been on the highest a level of, of interest, so... Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it's something we'll continue to follow. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, just to remind everyone, we've had Andreas Umland, Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Euro-Atlantic Cooperation, and Ulrich Speck, Senior Fellow at the Transatlantic Academy in Washington, D.C., here in the studio. Thank you again. Thank we'll you. be right back.